Do you think that West have realized what happened? No, to some extent it reminds me of what happened with Chernobyl. What I see, unfortunately, doesn't give me a very optimistic outlook. Defeated, humiliated Russia that seeks revenge, a very dangerous scenario. The Russia that is disintegrating, dangerous scenario as well. Russia still having veto right in the NATO. No, they don't. Hello everyone from Riga, capital of Latvia. Uh, together with European Pravda, you have a chance to listen to a president-elect of Latvia, Edgar Serenkevichs, about the future of Russia and, of course, about Ukrainian war. Hello, president-elect. So, first of all, I have to congratulate you with that victory. Uh, and uh, um, despite I'm not entitled to, uh, but I invite you to Ukraine. Uh, would you visit our country soon? Well, first of all, thank you very much for congratulations. I have been a frequent visitor to Ukraine, and I very much hope also to uh, visit Ukraine in my new capacity. Let me assure you that uh, Ukraine is among my one of the first uh, top destinations. Uh, and of course, uh, for not only for Ukraine, but I guess for um, a large part of the world, uh, the key news are coming from Ukraine now connected to Kachovka. Um, I know that you are tough and I appreciate it. But uh, my question is, do, do you think that West have realized what happened? No. I think that it is very difficult for many to understand how uh, big this tragedy is. Human loss, uh, ecology, environment. And I think that uh, this is uh, something that will come as realization a bit later. You know, to some extent, I don't want to compare those two accidents, but to some extent it reminds me of what happened with Chernobyl nuclear power plant. I think that first, in first days, there was not a realization what it meant for the world and for Ukraine. Uh, I do believe also that uh, this, and as we see also uh, more pictures, more videos emerging, this realization is going to come soon. And I would say also the problem is that uh, some headlines that made Ukrainians angry uh, say that like uh, uh, Ukraine and Russia are playing blame game. Uh, have you seen that kind of uh, headlines and what do you think, what, what do they appear? Well, this is not only a war on the ground. This is not only military operation, this is also huge uh, propaganda and information warfare on part of Russia. And I think that we all know the basics of the Russian propaganda. You sometimes even don't try to push your narrative, you just try to cast the doubt. And that also works a bit. You know, this is not so clear, there are no uh, facts, so we need more evidence. That also very well plays into the Russian propaganda. And so I do believe that we also need to look at this as the huge info. Uh, to be uh, clear, uh, could you indicate your position? Uh, what has happened? Uh, who did that? Who's guilty? I think that it is absolutely clear that this is the Russian responsibility. I tweeted that when the news came and when the first facts emerged. And of course, we need more time. so. I will use the term most probably this was part of the kind of military operation simply to counter the uh, offensive of, of the Ukrainian forces. I do believe also that uh, this is where we need, of course, uh, an investigative process to establish who uh, was responsible for giving direct orders, apart, of course, from general responsibility when it comes to Mr. Putin and his cronies in, in the Kremlin. And uh, yes, indeed, uh, we have now kind of two or three track approach. Uh, first of all, to help Ukraine any way we can. I uh, want to stress that uh, here people, when they saw and heard the news, have doubled their efforts to help Ukraine with everything they can. There is a kind of new uh, wave of uh, collecting uh, goods, collecting money and uh, also providing support for Ukraine. The government also has 
decided, as we speak, actually the government is deciding on financial contribution. But second is also how we are going to address this situation in the long term, reconstruction, uh, helping to cope with that. I think that nobody has now a clear assessment what it means to the environment, what it means in the long term. This is impossible in, in, in the coming days to do that. We will see those long term impacts and we will have to, 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 to react to in that way. From the kind of political repercussions, let's face it, uh, my country, Latvia, has always been advocating for much tougher uh, sanctions when it comes to Russia. Not always we are being listened to, not always the decision making is as swift as we would love to. But we'll keep on pressing. Is that a war crime? Uh, well, this is for lawyers, of course, to qualify. Is this uh, part of genocide, war crime? But definitely it's a crime. Definitely it appears to be a war crime. Seeing what, what has happened with people, I think this is also falling uh, under this definition of genocide. But, you know, uh, let's face it, to, to, to have a correct legal term in this respect is probably not the main thing. There are going to be courts and investigations. This is the crime. War crime, genocide, ecocide, this is clear crime. Uh, uh, anyway, I have to ask in this connection, uh, do you believe that international law is still alive and, and can bring uh, to justice those responsible? Not only here, not only due to this uh, uh, lawless action, but uh, in, in general, because in Ukraine many people doubt it. Yes, uh, I'm rather optimistic that uh, ultimately the international law is going to prevail. But look, uh, we can look at history. When Nazi Germany started war, back in 1939, the World War II, it took six years before that country was defeated. I do hope that this time this is going to be quicker, that Ukraine is going to win much faster. And it took one year uh, when Nuremberg Tribunal handed over sentences. So it takes time, unfortunately. Uh, second, I do see that those efforts by International Criminal Court, indicting Mr. Putin as the criminal, those are steps in the right direction. But unfortunately, this is not like in movie or as we sometimes expect in a real normal life that if somebody has committed crime, the police comes, catches him and brings to the court. Yes, this takes time. This takes enormous effort to establish uh, all the facts and also to work for criminal proceedings. But I do believe that sooner or later, and I very much hope sooner than later, those responsible for launching this war, those responsible for committing all kinds of war crimes will be brought to justice or some of them will not be able to enjoy nice and comfortable vacations or uh, uh, some kind of holidays uh, in the civilized world, that's for sure. I have a question about uh, the future event in Vilnius. Ukrainian expectations that this summit would be decisive, historical. Uh, are they correct? Well, I would be very, very careful to name each and every summit as historic and uh, breaking. But what I expect from Venus, I think that also everyone expects that uh, this is the summit where clear, not only message is being given to Ukraine, we have already that message since 2008, the Bucharest summit, that one day Ukraine and Georgia is going to become uh, NATO members. But also there is a clear roadmap how, when. But the, the problem here is that, yes, we have now 31 NATO member. Uh, as in such large organizations, you have very different views. Latvia has always supported Ukraine as NATO member as soon as possible. So what we currently see is, no, there is not going to be a decision to invite Ukraine to join NATO in Vilnius. I think that's clear and uh, nobody should have any 
illusions about that. But what we are working uh, hard now to get as much as practical, very, very concrete, very uh, detailed way, how and when and what would be those kind of things that both the alliance on one hand, but also Ukraine on the other hand, could and should do in order for your country to become full-fledged NATO member very, very soon. Uh, let me check if we are on the same page, because it's important. Uh, you referred to, to Bucharest's decision uh, adopted back in 2008. Uh, it it, it uh, has not only a position about Ukraine will be a NATO member together with Georgia, but it also says that Ukraine uh, will have to, to come through membership action plan, MAP. Uh, now, Ukraine says that we do not accept uh, MAP way. Uh, is NATO aware of that? What can we do with that? Well, this is the permanent uh, process of mutual consultations among NATO allies and with Ukraine. Uh, you are correct, but you know, this was back in 2008, so 15 years ago, uh, membership action plan was uh, the tool for those countries that were applying to the alliance to go through certain process. We have progressed since that much better in, in different ways. Actually, uh, there are so many mechanisms that we have uh, within NATO to support Ukraine, with Ukraine, to consult each other, that uh, were not envisaged in that membership action plan. That we went through membership action plan before candidacy, but that was completely different historic uh, perspective. I would concentrate now not so much on, uh, let's say, uh, maps or not maps, but on very practical roadmap for Ukraine. Let me explain why why uh, am I that much insistent on uh, MAP, no MAP, because um, we in Ukraine, and it's not only our leadership, but also a full consensus in Ukraine and uh, my expert society is that uh, uh, if we have a, a roadmap like MAP with like uh, ticks that we have to tick, it uh, gives Russia time to, to undermine this process after uh, Ukraine wins the war. I have a completely different perspective on this. Look, uh, there are two organizations. One is the European Union, and then you have all the criteria, accession talks. Yeah. And those are really critical. Why? Because in order to be part of single market, in order to be part of EU, you need to reform a lot. And one needs to check if not only legislation is in compliance, but also all the instruments. NATO is a bit different. NATO is a political and military alliance. And ultimately, what we are really all interested in is if uh, the armed forces of potential uh, NATO member are capable. I think nobody is doubting the capability of the Ukrainian armed forces now. This is one of the best, if not the best army in the world at this point, fighting, uh, fighting the war. Uh, yes, there are some political considerations. You know, there is, if we go through the kind of uh, systems and paperwork, then I can remind you that back in 1995, there was a study on NATO enlargement that says that you don't have to have any territorial disputes. Look at Ukraine. You didn't create any territorial disputes. Russia occupied Crimea and Sevastopol back in 2014. Russia started its aggression in Donbas already back in 2014, and the full-scale invasion and, and even more territories have been occupied. It's not fault of Ukraine. So I wouldn't say that this applies in this circumstance. Uh, so from that point of view, yes, I understand uh, this kind of uh, hesitancy that uh, creating some kind of mechanisms and then ticking box is dangerous. But I would say that at one point, this is going to be purely political decision. At one point, if I look back at the history of the Baltic states, one could say, you guys do not have uh, five divisions. You don't have, uh, I don't know, air defenses uh, or, or nuclear weapons. Well, obviously we don't have. So why should we take uh, small 
Baltic nations as part of NATO, but then at the end of the day, uh, when they saw how well we are progressing with, with reforms, the decision was ultimately also political. And here we need some kind of uh, things that Ukraine need to do, that's true. Some, some things are relevant, information security, some defense, but ultimately I believe this is going to be a political decision. How do you see when Ukraine can be a NATO member? That's why I don't want to answer this question when it comes to years or, or months, because... But once Ukraine, once hostility ends, one Ukraine wins, one, once what? Look, my answer is uh, we must do everything that we can that Ukraine becomes a NATO member as soon as possible. But if I start to talk about years, this is creating false expectations. The problem at this point, frankly, is not so much Ukraine. The problem is internal NATO discussion. I see a problem as a, a Russia still having veto right in the NATO. No, I don't think that Russia has veto right. I wouldn't put it in this respect. If that would be the case, Latvia would never become NATO member. Estonia would never become NATO now, member. They do uh, no, they don't. Uh, I think that uh, there is a bit different uh, approach. Uh, the approach is that uh, there is not a very clear understanding in many capitals uh, how you handle the situation when there is a country at war joining the alliance and what it means when it comes to the Article 5. I'll be blunt. This is the major question. And this is the question that many capitals are not able to answer. And while they haven't answered that question internally, they can't answer that at the table uh, where NATO allies are sitting. And this is not exactly what I would call uh, Russia's veto right. Okay, because in Ukraine we are very much afraid of uh, the elephant in the room, which is Hungary, uh, which is related to this. I think that if that would come to the kind of final decision-making process, I do believe that each and every ally would agree. But I think that this is this major question. There is a country at war, there is Article 5, and I think that it's not one or two member states. There are many member states that are trying to comp contemplate what it means for the alliance. There have not been a good answers in many capitals, and we should understand that. My position, okay. one more time, we do believe that Ukraine belongs to NATO, Ukraine will become NATO member and we will try to do in our what what's what's possible in our power that this happens sooner than later. But here that's unanimous decision by thirty one, maybe very soon thirty two member states. EU, Ukraine needs to pass through uh, enormous reform uh, agenda. That's that's fully correct. And my media, uh, as uh, also a think tank, we advocate for that. Uh, but also, what uh, a bit disturbs me is that in twenty twenty four, Hungary would be uh, would chair a council of the EU, which also have a decisive role. We see Hungary, which doesn't obey to European values, which openly goes against European values. Uh, and also we see that uh, there is a discussion even to postpone a Hungarian presidentship. Uh, is that really considered? The presidency is something that you have as part of governance of the European Union. Uh, I'm frankly, with all the issues that we have with Hungary, I'm frankly a bit skeptical about this kind of postponement of the presidency. Uh, if one has full rights within the European Union, uh, then one also need to be treated in this way. Uh, we have Article 7 procedures. Uh, we haven't voted on those, and while we haven't voted on those, I think that uh, if we are really rule of law uh, organization uh, based on uh, on laws and procedures, then we should also allow countries to continue with the presidencies of its signs. Okay. When it comes to the enlargement, what we call enlargement, because that's really part of the presidency business in the General Affairs Council, uh, I could only say that I believe that after receiving a report from uh, EU Commission, uh, I do believe we need to start 
accession talks with Ukraine by the end of the year. But then this process definitely is going to be also very technical, based on a lot of things that need to be checked, whether uh, that or another legislation, EU legislation, has been enacted. But we need to have this kind of political push to start this process. And then, of course, it's up to the Commission and up to the Member States that uh, regardless who is the President of the Council for six months, that this process goes smoothly. But here also, this is a uh, responsibility for Ukraine also to, to do a lot of things. It's not only then a political issue from the part of EU. Let's talk shortly about uh, post-war reality. Uh, and I, I, I have to start from uh, what we see now in Latvia as one of the examples. Uh, Latvia is also feel consequences of the war. Uh, Russian goods cannot come to Latvian ports. Uh, it means no goods, no fees no money for this, this important uh, industry. And I expect that uh, people would, uh, uh, would have some fatigue on that. How do you see, uh, would, would, wouldn't that uh, uh, change uh, perception of the war and would it change uh, will to restore uh, relations as normal with Russia, maybe immediately after the war? You know, I don't see at this point this tendency. Well, we do have some significant uh, Russian community here. And some opinion polls have shown that uh, a quarter support Ukraine, a quarter support Mr. Putin and Russian aggression. And then there is this kind of confusion, uh, among probably, Russians, yes, Russians. Among, among, among Russians speaking. At the beginning of our interview, uh, I said that there has been kind of another wave of support for Ukraine in the society after Kahovka. Uh, damn uh, destruction. When it comes to the economy side, well, but frankly, we already had uh, some uh, decrease of, uh, uh, let's say, transit uh, before the war started. Not only because of COVID, because Russia was deliberately trying to reorient a lot of goods from Latvian ports to their own ports. So that was the process that already started. Uh, I do hope, I do hope, and that's also part of my job in this capacity as the foreign minister and in the new capacity as, as the president uh, to not uh, have this kind of fatigue uh, to go into the society. But at this point, frankly, I do see that uh, people still have a very strong emotion and feeling in a positive way for Ukraine. How do you see post-war Russia? Is there, a post -war, uh, is there a place for post-war Russia on this earth? Well, uh, definitely there is uh, a situation where there is going to be Russia. I don't know how big, uh, whether even more imperialistic, uh, more aggressive or more democratic, I don't know. Uh, what I see, unfortunately, doesn't give me a very optimistic outlook. I see that the uh, majority of Russians are backing aggression. I see that uh, at this point there are no signs that uh, the power of the current leadership is somehow eroding. All the uh, counteroffensives by Ukrainian armed forces, the kind of feeling in Russia that they are losing that war and someone is responsible will be kind of flourishing, we will probably see um, consequences. But we do not know if uh, that means the situation where uh, Russia will be seeing for revenge, to regroup and to revenge. Would it mean destruction of Russia as we know? in? Smaller parts. You don't believe so? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think that uh, they, we, we are still open to many scenarios. I will be very, very careful to predict anything. Uh, I would say that my job would uh, be trying to prepare for all kinds of scenarios. Defeated, humiliated Russia that seeks revenge, a very dangerous scenario. The Russia that is disintegrating, dangerous scenario as well. What is going to happen with nuclear weapons? What is going to happen with 
people and some kind of internal conflicts uh, within Russia, like uh, I don't know, civil war or, or breaking up entities fighting each other or, or something. We are still bordering Russia, so dangerous scenario as well. They could be also a scenario where Russia tries to declare that we were victorious and look, there is a kind of situation where they try to portray to their own society, let's go further. Also the scenario, probably great scenario that Russia goes the same uh, uh, path that uh, post-war Germany, uh, gradual democratic change. Fantastic. Do I believe it? Skeptical as, uh, as, as always, because I think that uh, in that case, you need to have also the same kind of situation that Nazi Germany went through. We are not also there. So I would not exclude any scenario, but I would say that uh, we have to be very, very cautious. So all those scenarios are something that will keep uh, presidents and prime ministers and ministers in bordering countries and not only bordering countries with Russia uh, awake days and nights. Thank you very much, Minister and President-elect, and uh, hope to see you soon in Kiev. Thank you very much. Thank you.